Hello and welcome back to another update where I cover the latest developments throughout the front line in the Russo-Ukrainian war. We start out in the southern direction towards the town of Lyapole where the Russians have slightly expanded their zone of control west of Mervopil in the direction of Lyapole. So we've previously seen the Russians launching attacks north of the town towards the Lyapole direction where they've captured the Dacha area along the river line. Now there's nothing between Mervopil and Huliepule other than the town itself. Now we see the Russians moving in a western direction likely to expand and widen the front ahead of any attacks towards Huliepule. This makes it evident that their objective is to widen the front according to or along the entirety of the front and start developing the situation in the direction of the roads towards Huliepule and directly towards it from the Russian positions, as well as the supply lines on the side and in the rear. Therefore, it is likely that the Russians will look to attack villages such as Cherone and Selenye High to the east, and expand the zone of control to the south of Oljepole before moving up towards Selishnishne. However, this is not currently an active section of the front line, therefore it is unlikely that the Russians will launch any significant offensive operations here in the near future. In the direction of Vuladar, the Russians have advanced further in the direction of the road, both to the south and to the north of the recent advance, where they are moving along the first line here to the north and captured the fortified positions of the Ukrainians in the south. This shows that the Russians, although they did not manage to cut off the road, have significantly improved their positions here east of Vladar, ahead of any operation towards that as well. This is a more active section of the front line where we have seen the Russians, after the capture of Novokhailivka and Pereskovivka, move in the direction of Konstantinivka to the point where they reached the outskirts of it, but since then have stopped that area, and this is likely in the continuous operation where they are aligning the entirety of the front line along the road before launching any operation. This is to completely deny the Ukrainians from using this road in its entirety with direct fire control over the entirety of it before launching offensive operations to gain control over and a foothold on it. This will allow the Russians to then flank the Ukrainian positions at Vladar and go beyond it. This will also allow the Russians to completely cut off supplies going to and from Volodar and starve out the town if they are unable to take it. Further north in the Avdivka section of the front line, the Russians have captured the western outskirts of Novoselivka Persia along the Vovsha river line and fighting now continues both to the south of the Novoselivka town and in the direction of the river line. Therefore, we see that the heaviest focus of the Russians here in the Avdivka section of the front line is this area right here, including the southern parts of Novoslivka Persia and the northern parts of the river line crossing. At the same time, we saw Russian progress in the direction of the Ukrainian village of Progress, and we see that they have captured the entirety of the forest area and have entered into the central parts of the village at the same time as they've captured most of the fortified positions to the northeast of the town, leaving only the ones directly north of it under Ukrainian control. We have also seen with the recent capture of the Ukrainian fortifications west of Novodaksandrivka, the Russians are in a very good position here in the northern direction, and they can flank the Ukrainian fortified positions from two directions, launching a pincer maneuver, and at the same time, if they manage to capture Poros and Vovche, they can flank the Ukrainian fortified positions to the south of the village, and they can completely avoid a river crossing by attacking from a northern direction through Poros and Vovche, towards the Ukrainian fortified positions and then flank the entirety of the river line. This means that the Russians now can focus entirely on capturing Novoselivka Persia and then redirect their forces to the north where they'll be launching offensive operations from that direction, completely avoiding the river crossing. In the direction of Chesovyar, we see that the Russians have captured the final parts of Kalinina. This has allowed them to strengthen their positions on the eastern bank and the next fight will take place here in the direction of Ryorivka, in the forest area, the fortified positions and the town itself. All of this will lead to a strong Russian flank in the north of Chesovyar, similar to the capture of Ivanivske, allowing them for a strong flank in the south. At the same time, we'll likely see a restart of operations in the southern flank of Bakhmut, where the Russians will look to regain full control over the entirety of the southern flank along the 
an outline. This will allow the Russians to have a strong position in the south to launch offensive operations was to push Kiev, Predeshine, and so on. And in the northern direction, capturing Rihorivka, then it will allow the Russians to move on to Urihovesilivka and cross over the canal, both in the north and central parts of the northern flank. This also allowed the Russians to attack across the canal line in the entirety of the front in the south to the north by Hyorivka. So we see heavy fighting taking place on both flanks, but not really that much over the canal. Further north here in the direction of the Siversk section of the front line, the Russians made a significant breakthrough towards Ivanodarivka, capturing the parts of the town and raising the flag on it. There's no confirmation of the entirety of the town being on the Russian hands. But with this, the Russians have captured a significant portion of the front here to the southeast of Siversk. This is the one singular largest advance of the Russians in the Siversk section of the front line since the initial Russian push in the summer of 2022. This is mostly due to the lack of Ukraine defenses between Spirne and Ivanodarivka. And as we see to the north of the town, there is this trench network that the Ukrainians have available across the river line on top of the hill. So this is much more important than Ivanodarivka itself. But the Russian capture of Ivanodarivka at such a fast pace shows that they are taking full advantage of recent operations. And Vimka is likely next, as it is also along the southern bank of the river line. The Russians will likely move along both the road from the south, from the east, and along the railway to move in the direction of VMK, capturing that as well, before moving on to the northern parts, where rather than moving along the railways in the northern direction towards Siversk, they will likely do that as well, but the main focus will likely come from the east, where the push will go in the direction of Verkhnokamyansky, as well as Blorivka, where they will push towards Siversk from that direction. The reason for that is that there are two defensive lines of the Ukrainians. There's one to the east of Siversk and there's one to the west of Siversk. The one to the east is filled with this defensive line here, filled with fortified positions and trenches. However, as we can see, some of those are on the western side of these forest lines and some are on the eastern side or northern side. The reason for that is that the Russians at some point held positions here and they started building fortified positions and they combined that with the already existing Ukrainian fortified positions. So this is a fortified position that is mixed between the two sides. At the same time, the heights located here are similar to that of the western side where there's also heights. The Siversk itself is located in a valley. As we can see here, Siversk itself located on the low ground at a 64 meter elevation, just southeast of it. It is at 150 meters at the fortified positions northwest of Spirina and Iverodarivka. It is at 190 meters. This means that the Russians attacking directly towards it would be at a 80 meter disadvantage. In the north, in the direction of Vechnokamyansky here, and the fortified positions to the east of it at an elevation of 140 meters, where the town is at an elevation of 100 meters, and the heights surrounding Vilorivka from the south, located at the highest elevation in the area, 216 meters, all the way to the northeast of Siversk at 180 meters, we see that the height advantage that the Russians are able to gain by pushing through the Vilorivka Vechnokamyansky direction it's much greater than if they were to push from the south, where they wouldn't really be at a height advantage. And you'd have to face off against heavily fortified Ukrainian positions at an elevated position. But we do also see that the Russian positions to the east of that and northeast of Spirina are also located at the heights at about 228 meters. This means that the Russians can move along the river side and the northern bank of it towards this north fortified position. But again, it will not be coming from the south, it will be coming from the east. Mapping that out, we will see the Russians moving from the north of Svirne along the river line towards the Ukrainian fortified positions, towards Vechnokamyansky and the fortified positions east of the town to then capture it, and along the heights to the south of Bilorivka towards Siversk, using those heights to gain an advantage and push towards the Ukrainian fortified positions in the area. Capturing them is not as difficult as other positions as, again, it is a combination of Russian and Ukrainian fortifications, 
And at the same time, capturing them will also allow them to use their own fortifications that they previously built, which would mean that they are stronger than if they only had Ukrainian fortified positions. Therefore, we see that the main push will come from the north of Ivan Derivka along the fortified positions and towards Siversk from the south from that direction, and generally the eastern direction from Verkhnokamyansky and Belorivka. In the Kremlin section of the front line, we again see significant developments as Russians have advanced both in the direction of Novosadove and Nevsky. This happens here to the east of Tony, where the Russians are moving in a northern direction, and to the east of Nevsky, where the Russians are moving along that section of the front line as well. The developments here are clear evidence that the Russians are looking to expand the front line rather than only attacking Tony and Yampolivka, where the Ukrainians managed to relocate their forces from other sections of the front line here to this section, and then launch counterattacks, which allowed them to regain a lot of territory to prevent a Russian offensive in the direction of Yampolivka and Tony. The Russians are now expanding the front line significantly, incorporating even more units, which would force the Ukrainians to again redirect even more forces or end up in a similar situation to Makiivka, where the Russians simply capture the town fairly quickly due to the lack of Ukrainian defensive positions in the area. So we see that the Russians are now focusing on widening the front and making use of their numerical advantage in the area similar to how the Ukrainians in the north have their own numerical advantage, which has now led to the Ukrainians gaining positions here in the direction of Staritsia, where recently had footage of Ukrainian units being hit by Russian FAB bombs here in the southern parts of Staritsia. And according to the most recent reports, it is likely that the Russians have been pushed out of the central parts of Staritsia and the Ukrainians have recaptured it leading to the Ukrainians having a foothold here in the central part and pushing the Russians back to Bukhrovatka. So we see that the Russians are having a difficult time in the northern section of the front line, where even Ukrainian sources claim that the Ukrainians have a 3 to 1 advantage, and that is the bare minimum of the advantage the Ukrainians have when it comes to the numbers in the north. According to the latest reports, they have about 80,000 soldiers in the Kharkiv section of the front line, that is in its entirety from the western areas here along the border that hasn't been activated yet all the way to the northeastern parts but that is still a lot of soldiers compared to the russians having only 50,000 including the ones still in russia how many of those have been committed to the fighting not a lot it's only a small fraction of those and it will not surpass 10,000 that means that the Ukrainians could have an 8 to 1 advantage if they use all of their troops against these two salients that the Russians have created in the north. But this also is one of the reasons the Russians have, are having so much success in the east due to the Ukrainians relocating so many troops in the northern direction to prevent any success from the Russians and to regain the control over the area. And they learned from their own summer offensive what only had a 1 to 5 1.5 to 1 advantage compared to now where they have such a significant advantage to be able to regain territory and we're seeing that the situation is really repeating itself the ukrainians are regaining some territory but they are struggling to do so and the russians have even been able to capture some territory themselves which really sets into question the tactics being used by the Ukrainians. If they have the necessary manpower and firepower in this direction, why are they struggling to kick out the Russians? That is a real question that needs to be asked by anyone who supports Ukraine. But that will be all for this update. Thank you all for watching. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and check out my Patreon for additional content. Thank you all for watching, and have a great day.